All right, so my name is Fernando Meloni. I'm a senior sales engineer at SignalFX. Um, today we're gonna go through roughly a 25 minute presentation of uh, what we do, how we do it, and basically a little bit of, of the uh, history about SignalFX, a little bit of the architecture, and then I'm gonna do a product demo. Um, we're gonna leave the questions to the end, but if you have any questions uh, in the middle, please raise your hand, we're gonna try to address them as we go. So, a few words of uh, who we are and where we came from. Um, we were founded uh, in uh, 2013 by the founders of the ODS platform, which is the operational data store at uh, Facebook. Um, they had a really good idea of what they wanted to do, but back in the day, uh, this was batch processing and it was really hard to understand um, how to cope, basically, with, um, with the scale. Um, they started doing their monitoring systems and they created this, which is strategy called batch processing, which basically take all the data in, process it, and then uh, generate some outputs. Um, but because they scale quickly, they realized that this was not enough. Um, because Facebook at that time ex basically explo exploded in scale, it was really hard for them to, to have an idea of you know, what was going on in, in real time, or they would have to wait like five to 10 minutes to understand um, what the data was doing. Uh, so basically they went back to the drawing board and they uh, started doing this in a streaming fashion. Um, they did this and that was basically in 2013 what was the, the foundation for our real-time streaming platform and monitoring, which is called SignalFX. So many of the companies right now are in, in this um, cloud native journey basically, in one of these three stages. You're either in lift and shift, so you currently have a, a Java application, full stack monolith, uh, probably in a data center or in a private or in a public cloud. Um, you are in the re-architect phase where basically dev, um, dev and operations, DevOps work really close together. Um, <clears throat> something like 10 releases per quarter or maybe more, but you're still doing a lot of uh, lift and shift uh, in order to move from monolithic applications into modular applications. And some of them, the ones that basically were born in the, in the cloud native area, are doing uh, microservices, functions, lambdas, and doing everything serverless. So they're, they're no longer thinking about full stack and they're no longer thinking about uh, servers in, um, in a physical way, but they're thinking about tasks and thinking about uh, deploying code fast, like 100 releases per, per quarter or sometimes 10 or 20 releases per week. Um, so, what's different in this uh, difference, uh, for example, in stage three? Uh, one of the challenges you, you face when you move through these different stages is that everything you have to monitor is, is new and complex. So basically now you have uh, your different functions, uh, your different uh, bas basically pieces of code running in different ephemeral environments. Some of them last for a few seconds, some of them even microseconds, and then it's really hard for you to understand what's going on and where. And because of this, many legacy vendors are struggling with, with these challenges. So it's really hard for them to understand uh, where the data is, or sometimes you have to instrument these applications in, a, in an old-fashioned way, and it's really, really hard to cope with the scale and the fast-growing uh, ephemerality of these environments. Uh, but that's why it's so important to overcome these challenges with a, with a powerful monitoring tool that can help you basically understand what's going on and, and, and where in this fast-moving pace um, changing environments. So, a little bit of the signal effects architecture and how we do things. But before that, um, I just want to remind you what batch processing uh, is and how it works. So metrics always arrive at a different pace, um, and these are stored in, in siloed uh, systems, basically in time series database, uh, that are not scalable. And it's really hard to understand and get, get the data out of this um, time series database because everything's concentrated in one particular place and data storage. Once you have all your data there and you're happy with it, you start doing analytics and you start doing visualizations and automation based on this. But, but the fact is that every time you do each of these things, you're querying to the single point uh, of, of storage. Basically, it's the, the single point of storage that all your data is in. It's really, really hard to start getting um, basically data and information. If any one of you uh, uses Salesforce or a CRM tool and you're running a report, for example, 
that has uh, two weeks of data, uh, you can see the difference between running that two-week report and, and a six-month report. So that's because everything's centralized and it has to be uh, processed and analyzed before it, uh, what you're able to basically see that data. The way we do things is that as this data com come in, um, we analyze it and we store it in two different places, the metadata storage and the time series storage. Um, I'm going to go through that a little bit later. Uh, in the, when we look at the APM side as well, uh, traditional tools do head-based sampling, so they sample only 1% of the data, and it's really, really hard for them to analyze more than that because, of, again, it takes time to analyze that, and it's really, really hard when you have highly ephemeral and really, really big systems. Um, for example, Datadog an analyzes only 1% and misses 99% of the, of, of the data up for the traces, so it's really, really hard for them to understand what's going on in these highly scalable systems. Uh, in signal effects, we use some, something called no-sample tail-based tail tracing, and basically we analyze 100% of that data. And the one in charge of that is uh, a component called the smart gateway. So the smart gateway sits right next to your applications, and it's analyzing 100% of the traces and spans in order to generate and, uh, and analyze anomalies. So we're not missing anything, but in fact we're analyzing most of it, in fact 100%. <laughs> And we retain what's an anomaly, and we retain what makes sense to be sent and analyzed then to the platform. So we can ingest metrics for multiple, from multiple sources. Uh, lambda wrappers, uh, lambda functions, sorry, with, with a wrapper, uh, Kubernetes environments, Docker, uh, anything that can send information to us or that can be analyzed and then basically pushed through our API or custom instr instrumentation uh, can be analyzed by our platform. We do that as well by, by, in, by um, basically placing something called a smart agent next to your applications. Uh, and we analyze that data by, by doing automatic discovery of, of these metrics. So as soon as you send the data to us, we do two things. We generate uh, metadata and we generate time series information. The metadata is human readable. and The time series is basically just the payload and the information. Um, think of it as, as, as an envelope, as a letter, for example. The, the, um, the time series is the payload, is the content of the letter, and the metadata is the address. So it's really, really good to enrich that data. And that's why it's separate in two different storages. Um, we do something else that's really, really important as soon as we get the data, which is basically uh, do dynamic lag adjustment and rollups. And this is important because we take the hit as we take the information, uh, so you don't have to do big queries on that amount of data afterwards, like I told you before, with batch processing. Um, we generate like one second, five minutes, five seconds, one hour, uh, different types of rollups. So it's really, really easy for you to understand then uh, when you're generating these, these dashboards. As well as dynamic lag adjustment, of course, because we appreciate that the data doesn't come at the same time. We then push this through the metadata and the time series lanes, and we store that in the particular storages, which is the meta store and the metric store. After that, we do something really, really important, which is um, uh, processing that through our um, basically patented uh, signal flow agent, which allows you to do a lot of uh, uh, data analytics. Um, if I mention, for example, um, if I mention Prophet or Pandas for Python, those libraries, how many of you know what that is? There we go, three hands, nice. <laughs> but basically, if you do this in a DIY fashion, uh, you could take all this data and process it, uh, create your data, your data sets, and process it through Profit to understand, you know, patterns and growth. Uh, but it takes a, long, a lot of time and a lot of main, uh, maintenance. And of course, you have to um, like maintain that system yourself and really understand what you're doing in order to generate that data. We do we do all of that for you. Uh, we have a group of data scientists that really really understand uh, what's needed in, in these cases, so you don't have to worry about that. I know it's fun, <laughs> but uh, sometimes not scalable. And after that, basically, as a result, we can generate automation, and alerting, and high-res visualization. Uh, in the APM side, that smart agent and that instrumentation also sends traces and spans, again, to the smart gateway that is in charge of analyzing those traces and spans and retaining what matters and what's important, like errors or long traces, long spans. 
then the Smart Gateway sends that as metrics as well. So we metricize that data uh, to generate all, all the same information and all the same data analysis that you can do from those traces and spans. So if you want to understand how long your application took, uh, for example, to resolve a DNS uh, address, or maybe to understand what the bottleneck is, it's really easy because we, we generate metrics from that as well. And then the Smart Gateway decides what to, you know, what to send and what to push to the platform uh, and, uh, and stores this in the trace store, allowing us to then push it through SignalFlow again and generate things um, like root cause analysis, uh, service mappings, for example, that allows you to do root cause analysis and debugging really, really fast and quickly, I again, in real time. Now I'm going to show you a demo of how this actually works. Let me just get out of presentation mode. Is that good? Yeah, perfect. So what you're seeing right here is a dashboard, and this is already inside SignalFX. Uh, this dashboard was created because I'm the service owner of this particular e-commerce platform, and I really want to understand this last part of the customer journey, which is um, checking if I have enough um, items in the inventory and then doing the checkout. So what you see uh, at the top left, let me see if this is good, yeah. So what you see here at the top left, if this works, yeah, right there, is the catalog request per second. Um, then you have the response time SLA. So right now I'm having like 3,000 requests per second. Um, I have an SLA of, of 100 milliseconds. I cannot go over that. Uh, that's why I started coloring this as, as maybe a minor or a warning, or uh, then I have alerts because basically I'm going over my SLA. Then I have the, the peak request latency, which is uh, for the last 10 seconds. And the reason I created this one right here is because every single chart is updating every second. So the, the data is updating it so fast that I want to see for the last 10 seconds how much the latency was. Then I have my request process per container, which in this case, this is an application that is perfectly low balance uh, in, in three containers, uh, as you can see right here. Then I have my request latency per customer. I have some customers that are selected because uh, you might recognize the numbers from a really um, famous series. But basically, I have three these super important customers that I want to take a good look at uh, really, really closely because I have SLAs with them. A service map that is generated automatically from the instrumentation of my application. All of these dependencies, each of these components were create, was created, uh, they were created automatically by pushing the traces and spans information for this particular application. Uh, then I have a heat map, so I can understand the different um, uh, load per container. In this case, uh, like I said before, it's a load balance application in three containers, uh, latency, et cetera, et cetera. But I was having a conversation with, with my development team, in particular my DBA, uh, who told me that we can actually improve this performance by, uh, by switching some of the uh, query statements for the database calls when we check if there's enough inventory. Uh, he told me like, yeah, we can just make some changes and I'm gonna improve this to probably less than 10 milliseconds. And I said, all right, yeah, that sounds good. So I'm gonna go ahead right here and do a deployment. In this case, I just deployed that application that I trust that is going to uh, improve my performance. So if you take a look at the right, right there in the event feed, that is the event feed of the things that are going to affect my dashboard. But I can see that actually it's not improving. <laughs> it's affecting my performance really, really, really badly. Uh, right now I, I see my pit request latency at almost five seconds. I see that the request per seconds are dropping from 3,000 to now it's 2,400. Uh, the latency per customer is, is crazy. It's off the chart almost. Um, and immediately, after this is happening for a period of 10 seconds, the platform recognizes that this is not normal behavior and that my customers are being affected right now, creates a critical alert, and, and triggers an automated rollback yeah, immediately. And you can see that these three colors correlate to these three particular tokens right here. The green, one, the green one is my uh, canary push. So I basically pushed and replaced one of the containers right here. As you can see, I replaced this one with this one. But also, you can appreciate how the requests are dropping over time, over a period of maybe 20 seconds. Um, and the reason why I triggered that alert is because I'm, I'm 
monitoring closely every second if the requests are dropping, and, over, and after 10 seconds I create a critical alert and perform a rollback because this is unacceptable. So all of that happened in a period of 25 seconds. I didn't have to, to call my DevOps team or, or raise a support ticket or something that alerts someone to go here and do, revert the changes quickly because we're affecting our customers. Everything's being monitored in real time and, with it, and automated, fully automated. So now that everything's back to normal and I have the luxury of time to understand what happened, I can click on that alert. And because this application is instrumented, I can go and view the traces to understand what happened in particular. But before that, I can see all the information that triggered this alert. It was a canary deployment. This was the customer that was affected, the container ID that ran out of memory or that had a problem. Uh, and I can easily click here and go and examine the logs in Splunk or Logs.io or the log tool uh, of choice uh, because I can data link these with different tools and carry the context so it's easy to do root cause analysis. But because this is instrumented, I can click on view traces for this time window and easily go to my microservices APM tool. So now I move from dashboards to microservices APM. And the good thing is that now I, I have the particular time window that I can analyze this. And I want to filter this by the deployment tab canary, because I want to understand exactly what that deployment cost. I can go and try to understand by analyzing each of the traces what was the problem. But because we have machine learning algorithms in the platform already that have been analyzing every single span and every single trace, I can click on top operations and see that, in fact, the top one that's taking 52% of the duration of all the spans is the call to the stock database. So I click there, I filter the one that was affected by that, go to one of the spans, and then again here I, I see, oh right, I see a lot of spans, a lot of traces, I, I really don't know where to look in particular. But if I filter this by the percentage of duration, or the duration that gets historical, I have different views of the same data that is basically comparing all that data against the historical normal uh, behavior, and it's telling me all of this is red. But the top one, in this case, is the call to the stock DB. I have a lot of information about that, that particular span, but in particular, I have the improvement <laughs> from the DBA, which is basically a select star from stock. So this is selecting 1.5 million records in my database. This is not an improvement at all. In fact, this caused uh, the container to run out of memory. And I immediately realized what the problem is and how to, how, how, you know, what do I have to do uh, which is, number one, fire the DBA. The DBA. <laughs> uh, number two, uh, fix this, this error right away because, of course, it's causing the problem. So in this 10 minutes, I was able to deploy new code, basically um, catch that error and do uh, revert of the code to the, good, to the good state, and then move to microservices APM tool that, that allows me to understand exactly what happened where and what do I have to do to fix it. Any questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. Anything that goes through your application that can be instrumented? Question. Ah, the question, yeah. What can you monitor? Uh, you, uh, HTTP information, uh, network information, or anything that goes through the, through the application. So an anything that can be instrumented that, that basically can be caught in the application code can be sent to the platform. So if you have an HTTP call, in this case, I can see that everything was originated by this request get, and I have exactly the URL, the time it took, the components. You can push anything you want. In fact, this is just a subset of the things that you can, you can push to the platform. You can enrich this with custom tags, custom information, properties, anything you want. That, anything that's useful for you at the time of troubleshooting. Any other question on how this happened? What do you have to do to get this up and running? No? That's good. So one of the, one of the last things I want to show in this case is how you can generate alerts. Um, am I good with time? Uh, you have still ten minutes. All right. Good stuff. Thank you. So I have this dashboard right here that is um, basically monitoring my Cassandra instances. Um, they told me that there were some issues before, but I, we've been having hundreds and hundreds of alerts uh, for the past weeks, and we don't understand if those alerts are actually useful. 
we call them alert storms, and people just are forwarding that to spam. <laughs> so it's not really useful if you have a lot of spam emails and things are up and running. So those are not useful alerts. But so what I'm going to do now is create a detector that tells me exactly if I have a problem and where do I have a problem. So I can go and create a new detector based on that particular chart that is analyzing my Cassandra time series database latency. Once I'm happy with the signal, basically everything that's drawing that plot at the top, which is in this case latency, uh, I can proceed to my alert condition. So you have multiple alerts. In this case, you can do a static threshold, so if things go like beyond 10, create an alert. You can do a heartbeat check. If people are familiar with Nagios, uh, this basically replaces it. You can just do a heartbeat check constantly to a resource or a particular signal, and it will alert you. Uh, resource running out, which is really good for disk and memory. It, it can analyze patterns of resources going down, so it alerts you before. It's kind of like proactive alerts, instead of just alerting you when everything's at 100 or zero, which is already post-mortem and useless. Um, outlier detection analyzes everything through a historical map and tells you if something's an outlier or something shouldn't be like that. Then we have sudden change, like spikes. So for example, right here, these are really nice spikes to illustrate what an alert might be created from that. Historical anomaly, again, analyzing historical data, but in a, in a different way, more customizable. And a custom threshold, just you set it up as whatever you want. In this case, I'm gonna go with static threshold. And I talked to my developers and they told me, yeah, if everything goes above uh, 3,000, so basically three seconds, you, you can just create an alert. So I put 3,000 as the threshold, and immediately I can start analyzing the data in the past 12 hours. So I see, ah, here is the problem. That's why we have hundreds of alerts. For the past 12 hours, with 3,000 as the threshold, I would be generating 271 critical alerts. So generate 271 critical alerts is basically useless. If I tell you all the times that things are wrong, that's not useful at all. So I went back and I said, you know, the reason why that's not working is because we're generating a lot of alerts because of this threshold. What if we put it to uh, 3,600? And I said, all right, things are working if we, if we put it like that. So I changed my um, threshold as 3,600, and I see that things below 3,600 will still be working, but now instead of hundreds of alerts, I will have 21 alerts. So maybe that's the thing that we need to take care uh, of. Uh, 21 alerts and not hundreds and hundreds. So it's a really, really good way to generate alerts and have a preview of the things that you will be creating based on, on historical data. Instead of doing the typical trial and error, you're not gonna set this alert, wait for a week, get hundreds of severity ones and zeros and everyone goes crazy for something that might, maybe it's not that wrong. So it's really, really good to prevent that. Once I have that particular threshold, and then I, I, I know it's useful, I proceed to the alert message. You can customize this message uh, however you want. You can put variables and things. It could be really dynamic, it's really, really good. Link to a run book or a tip. Uh, if people know how to fix this, yeah, go here and you will know what to do. Uh, and then the recipients, which is really, really important as well. You can add uh, emails, Slack, Victor Ops, uh, Ops Genie service now. And now with the latest edition of Jira, you can create an alert, uh, you can create an issue directly in Jira based on alerts. So it will create um, a warning, it will, it will create an issue in a particular, for a particular team or a particular uh, team of DevOps or project, uh, which is really, really useful to close that loop of full automation between monitoring and, and support. Uh, so once that's done, you proceed to alert creation, and that's it. It's as easy as that. It's really, really useful to prevent those alert storms I talked about before. And last but not least, I really like to, uh, to end with this. These are all the things that we can integrate with out of the box that are really, really easy. That doesn't mean that we cannot integrate with your system. So maybe you have um, a particular uh, API or you have a particular script that you want to integrate with um, or you want to push custom metrics. Um, it's really, really easy to do that as well. Um, we support AWS, GCP, and Azure, um, as well as different notification services, as, as I showed you before. Uh, federation login with SAML, uh, some things are already created for you and out of the box, it's really easy, for example, ping identity or Okta uh, to, to have the like, enterprise login. And last but not least, again, uh, all the different APIs that you have to instrument and your applications with and send metrics to our platform. And that's it. Any questions?
things that you can do, things that you can't do. We can talk about those later. <laughs> All right. Thank you.